We're going to start tonight with a public hearing on the Texas Academic Performance Report. Dr. Knoll is going to present that report. And at the conclusion of the report, if you have a comment, we ask that you come to the podium, state your name, and if you keep your comments to about two minutes, we'd appreciate it. So at this time, I'll turn it over to Dr. Knoll. Well, good evening, President Bush, members of the board, Dr. Stockton, members of the community. It's good to see all the principals turned out for this tonight. I'm sure that you were excited to hear the annual performance report, and we appreciate you being here to hear it. <laughs> oh, there might be something else going on. Okay. Let me have my moment, principals. Okay. Uh, board members, as you know, we present uh, many opportunities throughout the school year to present information to you and to the public uh, to tell you exactly how our schools are doing. We came to you just a few months ago and shared a pretty comprehensive report uh, of our academic uh, performance. And tonight is a chance to highlight the taper, the Texas Academic Performance Report that the state puts out on all school districts and all campuses. Um, this is a 21-page document, so I will not be going line by line tonight. Uh, instead, I will try to pick out and highlight a few areas that maybe we didn't touch in our previous presentation, just so that you can uh, get another look as how, at how we're doing. So for tonight's uh, performance report, I'm going to be using that taper, also the PEAMS financial standards report, and we'll also look at some information uh, about incidents on our campuses and also how our students are doing in college. The first slide is one that we should be very proud of. The, the, uh, our rating for 2016, accountability rating, is met standard as a district, and our 2016 special education determination status is meets requirements. Uh, last year, this was an area that the state noted that, that we need to work and improve upon, and I'm proud to say that we've done that this year. Uh, it's not an area that, that we're finished working. We will continue to work, but it, it, is a, it is an opportunity for us to celebrate and for all of our teachers and campus staff to celebrate. As we know, all of our students are general education students first. And, and so it's not just those, those teachers that work with these students in specialized settings, but it's all teachers on a campus that made this rating possible. Our enrollment continues to, to rise at pretty much the same slope that it's been on for many years. Um, last year, our official enrollment was at 58,014. Our enrollment as of this morning was 59,960. So right there at that 60,000 threshold. When you look at our student membership, this is just our uh, demographic data straight off of the website. Part of what we do is we try to analyze our performance is to compare ourselves against other top performing districts in our area. And, and it'd be great if we could find you know, five districts that look just like us. And, and these are all fairly close, but I would tell you they're not exact. You know, Sci Fair, for example, is almost twice our size in enrollment. Um, KD, for example, is you know, almost 10 points less in socioeconomic students than us. So it's not a perfect match, but, but these are good districts for us to benchmark ourselves with, and it helps us um, to see exactly how we're doing. So the first slide here, you can see star percent at level two for all subjects, 85% of our students met that goal. And then at the advanced uh, standard for all subjects, 30% of our students. And our students that met or exceeded progress, this is that index two that we talk about when we look at our performance report, 68% uh, of our students in math, 64% of our students in reading. And our English language learners, how did they perform? 61% at level two. And our special education students at 49% at level two in all subjects, once again. And then level two in advance for our economically disadvantaged students. You can see 73% at level two and 13% at the advanced standard. Attendance rate is, is a factor that we have been working on uh, year after year. We continue to work on it. Uh, you can see at 96.2%, uh, and we are behind a few of our peer groups there, but, but what I really want to highlight is the work that we've done. Uh, you can see our growth when you go back to 2011 and we were below the state average and, and knew that we had work to do, and, and our campuses have done great work and brought us all the way up to 963 
for the previous year and then last year, 96.2. So we continue to be strong, and that's a community-wide effort, you know, that involves education and programs that we have throughout our district, but it really starts in the classroom with individual teachers. And when those students know that their teacher misses them every day, they, they want to be at school, and that's that's what I would really attribute this this uh, improvement to those teachers really working hard. Our dropout rate this is we would love for this to be at zero, uh, but zero point one for our seventh and eighth graders and zero point five for our ninth through twelfth is very strong. And the taper gives us a, a look at our graduating classes in a unique way. It starts with a four-year graduation report. So you can see our class of 2015. And how did they do over that four-year period of what we would think is a traditional high school time? And um, for us, 95.7 graduated. But the, the column that's the most interesting is the 2.1 that says continued. Because that's a group that maybe they just didn't get it done in five years. Life could have happened. Anything could have happened. But it it, it held them back and so the taper does show us also a five-year report and you can see when you go to our five-year report uh, the class of 2014 so this is not apples to apples because it's two different classes but uh, 96.5 when you go to the to the five-year cohort so those students that do continue find success and it's a lot of hard work by the high schools to make that happen to go out and find those students and make sure that they come back and and see the path to become a high school graduate they they go out and capture them. It's not always easy, um, but they do it, and they do a great job to help those students get across the stage. This is one of those slides. Probably the last year we'll get to show this one because of the changing plans, and it, it'll change and it, its look. But you know, what percentage of our students graduate on the the what the state would consider the tougher curriculum track, taking the, the more advanced ac academic programs towards a diploma? And you can see 88.7 uh, is really a great, great number for us um, for our recommended plan and distinguished achievement graduates. Percent of students taking AP exams, 36.2, a very high number. And uh, it's one to be proud of, but I would tell you it only gets magnified when you think about our dual credit programs as well. There are a lot of school districts that focus on kind of one path or the other. There are, dual credit district or they're an AP district we're, we're both we meet the needs of all students in any way they need to be met and so while we have 36.2 and you can see it's a great number compared to our um, the benchmark districts when you think about we also have all of those dual credit courses being taken and earning college credit we have a lot of students that are earning college credit and as a parent of a soon to be college student we, we all appreciate that that we can get that college credit in high school and that saves mom and dad and, and in addition to saving money for mom and dad especially for first gen students when they get that college credit in high school but it really opens doors and makes them believe and know that they can become a college graduate it gives them that that um, that feeling of confidence as they enter uh, college and then the percent of AP test above criterion, we're at 66%. Um, you can expect if you test more students, you're at, your mean's going to go a little lower. Still, ours is very strong, um, even with taking uh, many of our students taking tests. 67.9% of our students uh, took the SAT and ACT uh, of our 2015 graduates, and that's a number that continues to increase for us. And how did they do? Well, they, they did very well. Uh, as we've seen in different measures and uh, our students perform at a very high rate on their, their college entrance exams. Now, we want to have academic success and that's absolutely the main thing in what we do, but it's not just about academics. There's another side to what we do and it helps us to, to be the most successful district in the area and that's the financial side. Um, we want to provide a top-notch education, but we want to do it uh, in a fiscally conservative manner that protects the taxpayers money and, and really is a bargain in the education world and and we do that when you look at the Texas smart school system which used to be called the fast system uh, there are only three school districts that have received the top rating for all the years that it's been in, in existence for six years and that's the five-star rating that's Conroe sci -Fair, and Friendswood and that's something that we should all be proud of and when we talk about those 
districts that we benchmark against, it's really kind of unfair because none of them look like us with tax rate. So in these other, these other slides we talk about, they sort of look like us, they sort of don't. None of them are, are able to do this. And this is a testament to the great leadership that we get from the board and our superintendent and the work of our, of our people because it, you know, it takes a, a lot of dedicated folks working really hard to achieve what these first slides have shown you at a tax rate at this level. And how do we do that? We do that because our operating budget reflects what our priorities are. It's truly a reflection of what we say our priorities are. Number one, if you look at instruction, it's at 60.42% of our operating budget. And you can go back as recently as about 10 or 12 years ago, and we would have been below the state average in, in uh, instruction uh, percentage of our budget. And today, you can see at 60.42, well above the state average. And, and that uh, really shows that we're dedicated to the classroom. Uh, just highlighting a few other uh, areas of expenditure uh, for us. When you look down at guidance and counseling, you can see we're, we're higher than the state average in guidance and counseling. We've made that commitment to having counselors on all our campuses. We added uh, the counselor on the high school campuses just a few years ago when House Bill 5 came to make sure that we could meet the needs of our students. And most recently, we're adding an additional crisis counselor uh, with your approval. Um, one area that you can see that we are um, really off the benchmark of the state is transportation. We spend much more money on transportation than the state. And part of that is just the nature of our school district. We are very large. Um, we travel a lot of miles. I believe it's 30,000 miles a day um, that our buses travel. So we, uh, that is a huge investment for us as a district. And then finally, you can see general administration. Um, Connor ISD is almost half of what the average district in the state uh, spends as a percentage of budget on administration. Here you can see our staff um, as it compares to the state. Our average years of experience for our teachers at 11.3, seven years within the district. Um, our teacher turnover rate at 13.7 uh, is lower than that of the state. Now, from time to time, you know, we have students that make mistakes on campus. Um, you think about our almost 60,000 students and uh, 178 days of instruction, that's about, it's over 10 million school days, uh, children's school days that come. And occasionally on those 10 million days, they are children and make mistakes and, and they do that. And so we, we do report those and, and of our uh, incidents that we report, I would tell you that felony controlled substance continues to be the number one uh, reportable incident that we have uh, in the district and it continues to be um, most commonly coming from the medicine cabinet at home it's prescription drugs that make their way onto a campus and a student is caught with those and, and that's what results in that um, felony controlled substance now this is an interesting report it's not included in the taper but it's, it's just kind of fun, so we, we like to include it because we don't include it in the last one and it's interesting. Uh, we're able to access a report that shows us how our 2014 graduates uh, are doing in college. And now this would only include students that are attending four-year and two-year public Texas schools. So uh, you'll see here 1,846 students uh, represented. We, we average 33 hundred or so graduates a year. So this is roughly half or a little more than half. Um, but we have more school, more teach more, more students, excuse me, that are in trade schools or uh, maybe in a private school or out of state. So this is not all of them, but so of the eighteen hundred and forty six, how did they do their first year of college? Well, most of them did really well. Uh, when you look at their GPA for the first year, you can see at 3.0 and above, um, almost 900 had a, a 3.0 or above, which is fantastic. And overall, if you look at 2.0 and above, done really well. Now there's 382 that are warming up. Okay, <laughs> yeah. I'm sure there's a family plan and they've gotten it figured out by now, but. Um, but, but they'll, they'll be doing great as well, I'm sure, very soon. 
all of this information, including um, a link to our taper report and this presentation is available on our website. Uh, and, and you can access that at connorist.net. And this will conclude the presentation. Great. At this time, I'll ask if anybody would like to make a comment, please come to the podium and make your comments. Seeing no movement whatsoever, that concludes our performance report. Thank you. Mrs. Bush. Call this meeting of the Conroe Independent School District Board of Trustees to order. Let the record show that a quorum of members is present and that this meeting has been duly called. That notice of this meeting has been posted in accordance with the Texas Open Meetings Act, Texas Government Code, Chapter 551. The time is 6.15. Um, everyone, please rise for the invocation and the Pledge of Allegiance. <laughs> Mr. Sanders will lead us in the invocation and Mr. Williams in the pledges to both the Texas and U.S. state flags. On March 13th of 2013, upon his election as Pope, Archbishop and Cardinal Jorge Mario Bergoglio of Argentina chose Francis as his papal name in honor of St. Francis of Assisi becoming Pope Francis. At his first audience on the 16th of March in 2013, Pope Francis told journalists that he had chosen the name in honor of St. Francis of Assisi and had done so because he was especially concerned for the well-being of the poor. He explained that as it was becoming clear during the conclave voting that he would be elected the new Bishop of Rome, the Brazilian Cardinal Claudio Humes had embraced him and whispered, don't forget the poor which had made Bergoglio think of the saint. Bergoglio had previously expressed his admiration for St. Saint Francis, explaining that he brought to Christianity an idea of poverty against the luxury, pride, vanity of the civil and ecclesiastical powers of the time. He changed history. Bergoglio's selection of his papal name is the first time that a pope has been named Francis the prayer of St. Francis of Assisi. Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. Where there is hatred, let me sow love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. And where there is sadness, joy. O Divine Master, grant that I may not so much seek to be consoled as to console to be understood, but as to understand, to be loved, but as to love. For it is in giving that we receive, it is in pardoning that we are pardoned, and it is in dying that we are born again to eternal life. Amen. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, Thank you, Mr. Sanders and Mr. Williams. Um, the first item on the board of, board's agenda is special district recognition of the Board of Trustees, Dr. Stockton. January is School Board Appreciation Month in the state of Texas, and here to express our, our thankfulness is Bethany Medford, Principal of Bosman Intermediate School. <coughs> Bethany. Good evening, President Bush, members of the board, Dr. Stockton. It's my honor to represent all of Connor ISD administrators, staff members, and students to thank all of you for your dedication to the Connor Independent School District. We want to thank you for the countless hours you spend volunteering and the immeasurable energy you expend assuring that our schools are the best, provide the best education possible for our students. Thank you for working so closely with our parents, professionals, and community members to create the educational vision for our students. Often we forget about the personal sacrifices you routinely make to contribute to the advancements of our students' education. Our students benefit every day from your dedication and commitment. Although January has been designated a School Board Appreciation Month, please know that we are thankful for all of you every single day. Our students have demonstrated their appreciation by providing the cards, posters, banners, small gifts, drawings, candy <laughs> that you see here tonight. 
Please accept these tokens of our appreciation for your leadership, support, and for the numerous hours you dedicate to our district. It's with your leadership that our students have the confidence and competence to become whatever they wish upon graduation. I ask all in attendance tonight to join with me in a round of applause to honor and thank the CISD Board of Trustees for their hard work, dedication, and commitment to creating a bright future for all of our students. <clears throat> moment and look or <laughs> all right uh, thank y'all very much anybody comments i just like to say thank you for all you do the staff the teachers the principals the administration uh the great report we had tonight we have a great district and i'm just really proud to be a part of it uh, i just like to echo those comments and, and just to thank you guys for making my job easy here so you guys do a phenomenal job at making our jobs easy so thank you sure. yeah I'd like to echo that I, I get asked a lot you know is it difficult being on the school board and I say well, not with the leadership and the principals and the leadership we have in the schools and just I know you guys are on the front lines and deal with a lot of issues and a lot of different things and you guys are really shaping the future of our country and I'm really just proud to to serve along with you and just feel humbled by everything that you guys do. I'll just say thank you. <laughs> As will I, it's been a, an easy transition for me coming in with this board, uh, helping show me the ropes and Dr. Stockton's administration. We're on your campuses uh, so often, not just on our Friday field trips, um, but I'm always amazed at, at the level of instruction we see in the classroom and leadership in the front office and and the dedication of the students on your campuses and that's that's really a reflection on you more than anything we do so thank you i'll echo everything that they said but uh it's incredibly special to see this district uh, not growing up in conner isd like some of our other board members we never knew who boards were or who superintendents were or anything along those lines as students and i enjoy that we get to be a part of you know the kids lives with y'all so thank you for allowing us that opportunity the next item on our agenda is uh citizen participation <clears throat> miss godfrey has anyone registered to address the board yes the next 30 minutes have been designated for public participation by patrons who have signed up to address the board in accordance with board policy bed Please remember that the board may not discuss or act upon any issues that are not posted on our agenda. The board has adopted complaint policies that are designed to secure at the lowest administrative level a prompt and equitable resolution of complaints and concerns. These policies provide that if a resolution cannot be reached administratively, that the person may appeal the administrative decision to the board as a properly posted agenda item. Copies of the district's complaint policies can be found on the district's website. Those that have registered to address the board will be limited to five minutes for their presentation. Delegations of more than five must appoint one representative to represent their views on the board to the board. Ms. Godfrey, please call the first person that has signed up to address the board. Kelly Maxwell. Madam President and members of the board, I appreciate your time today. Thank you. During a time of exponential growth within a district, promoting innovation and differentiation through instruction, product, and assessment, I pose the following question. How might we continue to better serve a population of gifted learners, providing them the desired depth, breadth, and complexity they so desperately crave? Thus, I ask the board to consider the following scenario faced by many families in the Oak Ridge and Caney Creek feeder zones. Their child or children have consistently demonstrated their aptitude in the areas of science, health, and technology, competing and placing in science fair competitions, scoring beyond their peers on a variety of tools used to assess their abilities. To many, this represents an opportunity to attend one of the two academies within CISD, to become a part of a fellowship, 
of like-minded peers. These are the children which dream of space exploration, eradicating genetically modified organisms from our diets, and being the one to hopefully lead a team or find the cure for what we'll never know if we continue to deny them a modest bus ride to the two highly respected academies within our wonderful district. Over the course of two years, I've experienced and listened to many rave reviews about CISD, but I have also experienced and listened to those reviews about where we might be shortchanging a population of students, specifically those which are invited to, to apply, and to attend the academies in CISD, only to discover that the burden of transportation will be placed upon the student and their parents. I've been told by parents and students that, well, we, we have a choice. We can either attend the school that we're zoned to or we can carpool with other families so that our children can attend school at the academy. And while I commend parents for coordinating these efforts, I look at the overall safety considerations and would not feel comfortable placing my own child's safety better, even speaking, than their education in the hands of someone else that has not gone through the rigorous screening process that our dedicated drivers go through each year in our district. I found myself thinking, children that are bused to DAEP from their home campus also have a choice to behave and adhere to a reasonable student code of conduct, yet we bus them all the way to downtown Conroe and pass at least one of the two academies along the way, which leads me back to how we might continue to foster a growth mindset, providing special populations of students their much needed depth, breadth, and complexity within an environment of like-minded peers. The solution is reliable, district provided transportation and thoroughly screened drivers to help them arrive to point A and return back. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. <clears throat> the next item is a consent agenda. Um, I haven't heard all members have had an opportunity to view this. Um, was there anyone that has anything they'd like to remove? I haven't heard anything. All right. Do I have a motion? Madam President, I move we approve the consent agenda as presented. Second. All right. All those in favor, please raise your hand. All opposed? The motion passes. Item 4A, consider the approval of the 2017-2018 school calendar. Dr. Stockton. Okay, I'll ask Dr. Noll to come back to the podium to present this item. Well, good evening once again. I'm excited tonight to present to you our 2017-2018 school calendar for your consideration and approval. Uh, our district level planning and decision making team has been hard at work uh, on this calendar since October. Um, as you know, we, we have an opportunity this year to have a little more flexibility in our calendar, which has generated a lot of conversation uh, and a lot of possibilities as we've worked through this. And so in October, we presented the district level team with, a, with a, I believe it was eight drafts, and we talked about many different aspects of those eight drafts. And, and from there, they went out and talked to different people within the community and their campuses, and, and I'm sure on social media, and got a lot of feedback as, as to what people uh, liked in, the, in those eight drafts and, and from there we were able to pare it down to three drafts that went out uh, on our district website for public comment. Uh, I would tell you that uh, we, with our new website under Ms. Blakelock's direction, um, we have really figured out how to get public feedback on our website, which is a fantastic thing because we wanted people to see the calendar and, and tell us how they felt and we had over 2,300 comments. Uh, received on our calendar and, and that's fantastic and so that district level team came back uh, last week and we met and they they really took to heart all the feedback that was given to them and and uh, we worked through that and they they created this calendar that we present to you tonight which is very similar to draft C uh, if you had noticed the, the ones on the website with only one slight change and I will highlight that uh, as we run through this so just with your permission I'll, I'll highlight this calendar and, and some of the changes that we see. 
And it, it opens up uh, with an August 16th school start date. That's a Wednesday. Uh, we've received a lot of feedback from parents, teachers alike, that the midweek start was very beneficial for our students to help them kind of work their way back in and get that stamina. I would say young students, but I think it's equally as important for, for the older and the teachers and, and all of us administrators to build that stamina back up. Um, it's also uh, very beneficial for the district operationally to start midweek because if we do need to make some strategic changes, uh, having that weekend come a little sooner for, to allow us to do that is a positive. So we recommend the August 16th start date. Um, moving forward through the calendar, you will notice that uh, as you get to October, we complete the first grading period in October on October 6th, and there's an early release day on October 6th, and then October 9th, a school holiday. A lot of feedback from both parents and uh, school staff alike that October students have began to hit a wall, and it's you know they they need a they need a moment, and it worked out well with with this calendar option that the grading period ended, so we have a, a half a half day there, and then Monday off. So it's a great opportunity for families if they wanted to travel or, or do some things to, to have an extended weekend in October. November, um, what has now become traditional for us to take a week at Thanksgiving it continued. It was very popular in the comments. And then our first semester ends on December 20th. Um, that gives us 84 total days of instruction in the first semester, which is five more days than we had this uh, first semester. It's not a perfect balance, but when you consider uh, all of the testing days that are lost to the second semester um, to be at 84 and 94 first semester to second semester is really uh, it, it may be ideal but it, it's right it's right there very close um, winter break then from the 21st and then teachers would come back on January 8th with uh, students returning on January 9th um, moving down you can see spring break uh, in March, and the, the one difference on this calendar from what was draft C is March 9th. Uh, our third grading period did not have early release originally, and uh, in the consent agenda tonight you proved a, an amendment to our waiver to allow us to have a fourth early release day, and so uh, we would recommend that we would have that fourth early release on um, March 9th, which works out once again very well that it provides early release before spring break, but more importantly, what that early release allows is teachers time to work on their grades and finalize their grades and get them input in the computers so that we can communicate more timely to our parents. And then as we continue through April and May, you notice that our final day for students is May 31st. Our teachers would work uh, June 1st and then uh, that would complete our school year. So once again, a lot of feedback, really proud of our team, worked very hard on this calendar and at this time I'd be happy to answer any questions on the calendar and we would ask for your approval. Madam President, I, I move we adopt this calendar as printed. I second the motion. All right. Any discussion? Questions? I just have a couple comments. I, I really appreciate the district level planning committee going through this exercise. I really like the midweek start date, like you said. I think uh, us creating that district of innovation really allowing us to start a couple of weeks early uh, really helps at the end of the year because I really like being out and done by May uh, and I think everybody else in the room probably feels the same way it gives you a full summer to really spend with your family and, and I appreciate that I appreciate the work that was done to add some days this semester versus uh, the, the spring semester um, I'm very happy. I, I think it was an excellent job done by the district level planning committee. Thank you. And I, and I would express that the, the committee would express their appreciation to you for giving them the option to work on that. And without your approval of the district of innovation, we could not have, have made those changes. So that, that's appreciated. I, I would also echo the district level planning committee with the eight drafts to pare it down into even the three that you took out to, um, you know the community was huge and then they really listened to the feedback and I, I appreciate uh, their hard work but the administration's work with listening to our community on this um, we have a motion in a second all discussion done let's vote all those in favor no and none opposed the motion passes this is our calendar yeah. all right
Item 5A, <clears throat> consider adoption of the recommended attendance zones for the Oak Ridge Feeder Schools. Dr. Stock. Okay, at this time I'll invite Dr. Hines to present uh, the recommendation. Good evening, President Bush, members of the Board of Trustees, Dr. Stockton. <clears throat> Tonight I'm, I'm here to request, uh, oh, thank you. request your approval of the recommendation for the attendance boundary zones uh, to coincide with the opening of three schools over the next two years. And just to kind of go back and um, recap where we are, uh, we started looking at the attendance boundary because we continue to grow as a school district and we've been adding roughly as was illustrated in that uh, enrollment growth chart earlier uh, approximately 1500 students per year and so to meet this demand we have to continue to add new schools and we are planning to open uh, Lucille J Bradley Elementary School uh, next year that will serve students in kindergarten through fourth grade It's going to be located at 4200 Falls Lake Drive and we will also, the following year, we'll be opening two schools, uh, a thousand student intermediate campus, uh, which we call Flex 18 until next year when you name it. And, um, and it will serve students in grades five and six, and it's going to be located at Woodson's Reserve Parkway in Trench Lane. Also opening is Grand Oaks High School in 2018, located at 4800 Riley Fuzzle, which will accommodate roughly 3,100 students. And this campus will open as a 910. Uh, which is our current 7th and 8th graders, and we will phase in a grade level each year until we have all four grades in August of 2020. So just a quick kind of review. There's a rendering of the high school, Grand Oaks High School, and there's a rendering of Lucille J. Bradley Elementary. And later on this evening, when Mr. Foster presents, you'll get some better pictures of the real building. Um, and then this is the rendering of Flex 18 Intermediate, which uh, we'll start construction later this spring. So to uh, decide or to determine the makeup of the students to go to that school, we uh, formed an attendance boundary committee um, this year, and that started, that process actually began back in October. Um, and I know we have several of our committee members here this evening. Uh, we had a committee with uh, that worked on the in elementary and intermediate campus question and then we also had the group came together with a larger group to work on the high school attendance boundary and uh, we have uh, if you'll just allow me a, a moment to recognize our members that are here tonight um, if you would uh, Dr. Christine Butler's here I believe uh, parent Kenneth Brown is here if you're here if you'll stand up and stay standing it'd be great uh, Alan Fisher is here uh, Tina Oliver, Lindsay Ardwan, Nikki Connolly, um, Deborah Spoon, Paola Gorman, Allison Mobauer is here, uh, uh, Dr. Povich, uh, Angela Lozano, uh, Don Hickman is here, uh, Tommy Johnson is here, uh, Dr. Gene Stewart is here who helped out, I know. Uh, there's, I hope I'm not missing folks. Um, Eldridge. From Tammy. Dr. Povich is here. Tammy Eldridge, Eldridge is here. Um, so we have several. Did I miss anybody? Kenneth Brown's here. So thank you. Thank you very much for your service. <laughs> and, and there are others who could not be here because of uh, other commitments, but uh, it's been a great committee to work with, and um, it's been a great process. Uh, we're, we don't all agree on everything, but we, we work well together and we were able to have some very frank discussions and, and work on this process. Uh, we actually started in October with early meetings and then uh, we had a, three rounds of community forums. The first round was just to go out and present uh, the process, what we were doing, and that's actually when we started receiving feedback um, about possible scenarios. Uh, after receiving that information, the committee came back together um, and took the different information. We created several scenarios, and then we, we looked at the goals and the consideration, and we narrowed it down to two scenarios for each of the three campuses that we brought forward in the second round uh, in December and November to receive feedback. And after that round of discussion, we started meeting again, and um, 
which led us to our recommendation scenario, which we took back out recently and shared with the public. Uh, we've had, uh, in addition to those public meetings, we've received over a thousand comments via the website, and it's. Uh, I want to thank Sarah Blakelock for her support and help on that too, managing a lot of information coming in. So we took all of that and um, and looked at it and came up with three recommendations that we'd like to highlight this evening and ask for your approval. The first scenario that we'd like to recommend is the one that we called elementary scenario two. Uh, this is the scenario that, uh, and the big maps are in the back. I also have some black and white paper copies of anybody in the audience. Um, this moves the Falls South, Legends Trace, Wright's Landing, Bristol Lakes are moved from Burnham Woods to Bradley. Creekside is moved from Broadway to Bradley. Uh, Legends Run west of Burnham Woods Drive is moved from Snyder to Bradley, and the Meadows is moved from Burnham Woods to Kaufman. Uh, Harmony, which is the area that's north of Lexington and east of Rayford, is moved from Broadway to Snyder, and it achieves uh, some very, some very uh, good numbers in terms of trying to get us at our target enrollment and leave room for growth at the elementary schools. Um, I know there was a question earlier uh, whether or not this impacted any of the schools in terms of title and none of these campuses are title schools and so uh, it does not change um, any of their status. So this is the map and the gray area that you can see in the map is what will become Bradley's attendance zone. Uh, this, this light green area is Snyder uh, and this is where we tried to avoid splitting neighborhoods. That's Legends Run, uh, separated by Burnham Woods Drive. So when we did it, it was on a major thoroughfare. Um, and so we also had a portion of Harmony, which is the A57, which was separated out from uh, the rest of Harmony to create room at Broadway. Um, and then the Falls was also split, but we have two elementaries in the fall, so it just really couldn't be avoided. So that's scenario two. <laughs> The, the intermediate scenario it, that we recommend is 2.1. Uh, this was originally 2, and we made a, a, a slight revision at the end to, um, to allow all of Bradley to feed into Flex 18 Intermediate. So uh, we were not, portions of Burnham Wood go to both Cox Intermediate and to um, Flex 18, um, but and all of Broadway will go to Cox Intermediate, but Snyder, uh, because of its closeness to Cox and because the majority of the areas that are served are um, east of uh, Burnham Woods Drive, it made more sense from a traffic flow and some other reasons that they would go to Flex 18. So uh, there were a couple of splits in that area, but Creekside, the Falls, Bender's Landing, Legends Run, Legends Trace, Wright's Landing, Bristol Lakes, Woodson's Reserve, move from Cox to Flex 18. <coughs> And under this plan, the Meadows would move from Cox to Vogel. Um, again, this doesn't impact anyone's title status. Uh, so the map comes out like this. Something that is coming in the future when we open Flex 19 in 2019, we'll have to do some rezoning, and that will have some impact on campuses. And, uh, and that's going to be located in the 242 corridor. Uh, and if that opens as a K-6, that will impact intermediate enrollment as well. Um, but this represents, the yellow will represent Cox Intermediate, and uh, the pink represents Flex 18. And then you can see the areas, uh, all of Bradley, and then uh, the change from 2.0 was Legends Trace, which is that area of 57G. 57K is the Meadows and they would move back into the Vogel attendance zone. For the high school, the committee recommends high school scenario one. This is the scenario that looks the most like the current junior high feeder zone pattern, uh, with the exception being that the Meadows moves from uh, going to York to Iron. So, so that would be something that we would move so that the Meadows would remain in a single feeder pattern all the way through. Um, that would be the major change. And this is this. So currently, everybody goes to Oak Ridge High School, uh, Fox Run, Creekside, Legends Ranch, Legends Ranch Estates, Spring Trails, and I, and some of these neighborhoods are more than these neighborhoods. But I'm, I'm 
just using those terms. The Falls, Legends Trace, Bender's Landing, Legends Run, Wright's Landing, Bristol Lakes, Lockridge Farms, Harmony, Woodson's Reserve, Spring Creek Pines, Discovery Creek Apartments are all going to be zoned to Grand Oaks High School. <clears throat> and you can see that leaves a projection, and these numbers are changing every day. These were based at the beginning of the year numbers. Um, but one of the realities of this scenario is that it leaves Oak Ridge maybe smaller than we would like. We have a lot of capacity there, so there was a lot of discussion um, about enrollment and ways that we can look at increasing Oak Ridge's uh, enrollment over time. So Grand Oaks High School, this is the map, and again, this looks just like the junior high feeder, with the exception of the Meadows, which is 57K, moving into the Oak Ridge feeder zone. And so that question came up, how will the district respond to that lower enrollment at Oak Ridge High School? And you know, and sh should you approve tonight, scenario one, the district would work to create additional enrollment at Oak Ridge High School by implementing an academy of some type that draws students from Grand Oaks High School. Uh, also a plan to allow a certain number of students to transfer, transfer from other high schools that are over capacity and allow transfers to Grand Oaks High School to attend the junior ROTC program at Oak Ridge High School. So there are some ways we can create some avenue of adding students uh, to Oak Ridge as well as having capacity, Oak Ridge High School is a very central location and it gives the district a great deal of flexibility in meeting future needs. Uh, the other question that we have is, uh, is about transitioning. <clears throat> we currently allow and would continue to allow students that uh, if they're going to be in their last year at a school to finish at that school if they choose, um, if they can provide <coughs> transportation, the parents can provide transportation. And now for the Meadows, we'll offer that uh, for students entering intermediate school all the way through high school if they so choose uh, to help with that transition. Because um, we have students that are at Cox and we have students that are at York, and that would give them the ability to, to stay all the way through. The students that are currently at Oak Ridge High School will finish at Oak Ridge High School. Again, if, if this is... Um, passed tonight and decided uh, we will begin to communicate the outcome we'll begin to make plans to identify accurate enrollment projections following the transfer process that will take place and then after that we'll start making plans on staffing for the new uh, for the new elementary school later this spring thank you dr. Hines Any questions Do I have a motion madam president I move we approve as presented and recommended by the attendance boundary committee second all right, discussion. Um, we, we thank everybody that was on the committee, but I would just like to thank Dr. Hines. Um, Dr. Hines, you did a fabulous job. I've been through several of these, and I don't think it's ever been smoother. And, and what I mean by that is not everybody is always pleased in a rezone, and, and admittedly so, and, and, and rightfully so. But I will assure everybody here that they have had ample opportunity to voice their opinion, and it has been considered. And these kids, they're not just numbers. I know there's lives involved here. But as we have seen through many rezones uh, in, in, in several uh, feeder zones of the, of the district, um, the school they're going to, I think one of the letters we received reflected this. Uh, the school they're going to is just going to be just as good as the school they came from, and 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 we're confident of that because of our awesome staff and and Dr. Stockton's wonderful ability to choose the right principal for the for the school. So I just wanted to thank you for a job well done, for listening to everybody probably more than once, <laughs> and 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 maybe three times or eight times, but uh, you were open, you kept the process open and everybody got their say. And while they might not have gotten their way, they certainly were heard. So thank you. I'd like I would to like add, to, sorry, go ahead. Uh, go ahead. I, I'd like to thank those parents and community members, uh, some of whom I think are probably here in the room tonight, that took the time to voice their opinion, to come out to the public forums, to fill out the form on the, the website, to make the emails, 
Um, I know at times it may not have seen, you may not have gotten a personal reply from everybody that you emailed, but um, every one of those emails was looked at. All those comments were looked at. Um, and and as, as Mr. Husband said, your voice was heard. Um, so thank you for taking the time and caring enough about the students to voice your opinion and let us know your perspective on it. I'd like to just add my comments. Uh, Dr. Hines, the feedback and Dr. Noel both. The feedback that I heard from the forums was that you were very thorough, that uh, you addressed every question, and uh, to the best of your ability, and that's all that can be asked. Uh, as has been said tonight, not everybody is going to be pleased with every part of it. Uh, we have to make decisions based on recommendations. Uh, I think that we're going to make the right decision, although it won't be pleasing to everybody. But I, again, thank both of you, Dr. Noah and Dr. Hines, for the hard work going to three forums and answering the questions and, and working with the committees. It's a lot of hard work, and it's a lot of extra work, and we really do appreciate it very much. I would thank you mainly for outlining the transition. Those were some of the questions that I got the most was how does this look for students that are, you know, especially Meadows students that are already in that feeder zone and are ready to move on to fifth and sixth. And so thank you for addressing that tonight in your presentation. I really appreciate that. So. All right. All those in favor? Any opposed? Motion passes. Thank you, Chris. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Dr. Hines. All right. Item 5B, Capital Improvements Updates. Dr. Stockton. Okay. Now, Mr. Foster, since we have people rezoned to these schools, show us what they're rezoned to. All right. Good evening, President Bush, members of the board, and Dr. Stockton. It's my pleasure to give you an update on our capital improvements we have underway throughout the district. I'm going to start you with Grangerland Intermediate Classroom Additions. I'm happy to report this project is open to the students. They took uh, took the class when they came back from the winter break, uh, and now we're beginning the process with a contractor to close this contract out. Moving on to our safety and security project, this is phase one that we're wrapping up this month, and we anticipate bringing phase two to the board for approval in March. At the Woodlands College Park, our robotics edition, this is a project that is currently on schedule. Uh, weather has a, has a major impact on this particular project. It's scheduled to turn over in March for the students to use. Uh, we did have a good uh, winter break with good weather during the winter break. Uh, we're currently trying to put the roof on that building. So the rain this week is giving us fits. So I hope to bring you a better update on our schedule uh, at the next board meeting, but right now, uh, if we can progress the way we've been progressing, we are on schedule. At our Network Operations Center, uh, this project is on schedule. It is the data and network infrastructure for the district. Uh, what you're looking at now, and this picture is a, uh, a in-progress photo of our core center. Uh, this project is on schedule uh, and is scheduled to turn over in July, uh, late in the spring, there's a very complicated migration process from the old equipment to the new, new equipment, uh, but that process is uh, planned thoroughly with our technology department and should go off without a hitch. At Lucille J. Bradley, our elementary school that has its new attendance zone now, uh, this school is on schedule, scheduled to open in August of 2017. Uh, scheduled to start school on August the 16th now with our new calendar as well. As you can see, the exterior of this building is going uh, very well. The roof and everything is underway as well. Interior, the bones of this building are really coming together. Uh, right here we are looking at the, uh, the inside of the ceilings that form our library's areas. Uh, the gymnasium in finishes in the building are starting to come along at this point. What you're looking at now are the delivery of the light fixtures and other, uh, other items that will be installed to make this campus fully functional. Now our 2017 life cycle project, which is approved at our board meeting this past month, it is, uh, I don't have pictures to show you at this point, but it is in the process of working through the contract with the contractor. Uh, we've had our kickoff meeting and we're working on uh, getting the work started in earnest. So at our February board meeting, we should have something to show you as far as progress. Moving on to Knox, where we're adding some science classrooms and also uh, working with the contractor to expand our the Woodlands transportation facility for our bus drivers. 
this project was also approved at the school board meeting last month. The contractors have mobilized uh, and we're uh, in the process of, of getting the, the, the foundations and other infrastructure underway for both the transportation center and at Knox. Uh, just happy to point out too that that both of those buildings are scheduled to turn over for use for August uh, next school year, so August of 2017. At Grand Oaks High School, this is a project that is also on schedule. Uh, at this point, uh, it is scheduled to open for school in August of 2018. We've reached a significant milestone on that campus where the building structure is essentially complete. So you can see from this photo, the roofing and, and other areas are starting to work their way from the west to the east. Uh, inside this building, it's starting to shape, shape, shape as well. Uh, the ground floor has the interior student corridors and the admin areas coming together. The building infrastructure and equipment is also being installed. As you can see, there's lots of uh, activity going on the inside and large, large uh, infrastructure, piping, plumbing systems, everything are in progress. And that project is moving along just as we would anticipate it would. And that is our update. Thank you, Mr. Foster. Thank you. <clears throat> Item 6A, consider approval of the 2015-2016 Comprehensive Annual Financial Report. Dr. Stockton. Okay, this time I'll ask Mr. Rice to come to the podium and present the item, please. Good evening, President Bush, members of the board, and Dr. Stockton. It is my pleasure to recommend that the Board of Trustees consider approval of the 2015-2016 comprehensive annual financial report, better known as the CAFR. First, I'd like to uh, take time to recognize the finance staff that's here that's uh, responsible for preparation of this report. We have Janice Stowers, Cindy Westra, and Karen Garza. They're all three here. If y'all would wave, at least recognize the uh, The CAFR was presented to the audit committee for their review and comments, and the report was favorably received by the committee. Mr. Kevin Sanford, who is a partner with Weaver, and they are our independent auditors. He is here to comment on the CAFR and then to answer any questions that y'all might have. Mr. Sanford. Good evening, Madam President, Board, and Dr. Stockton. Um, as Darren mentioned, I'm the partner on the district's audit engagement. Um, we're not going to go through the financials in detail. Obviously, that was with the audit committee, but if you do have any questions, I'll be more than happy to answer those. Um, but I do just want to say thank you for the opportunity to serve as the district's auditors. It's our privilege and pleasure to do so, and we sincerely appreciate, as Darren mentioned, there's countless hours that go into the, the preparation of this document, but also as, as we make you know hundreds of requests of district staff in order to complete our audit. So there's a lot of hours that go into the preparation of this document. Um, so thank you to, to them, and thank you to, to you, and again, thank you for allowing us to be here. Thank you. Thank you. Madam President, as uh, Audit Committee Chair, I recommend that we approve the CAFRs presented. And second. All right. Any discussion? Questions? All those in favor? Raise your right hand. All, none opposed? The motion passes. Thank you, Mr. Sanford. Thank you. All right. The next item on the agenda for the board's consideration is the appeal order under CISD policy FOD pursuant to local government code sections 551.082 and 551.0821. The appeal hearing will be closed to the public as it involves the discipline of a public school children and personally identifiable information about a student will be revealed by the board's deliberation. The time is now 6.59. All those in the audience not directly involved in this matter are excused, and we will take a five-minute break. Okay, I'll ask at this time, is there a motion regarding this matter? Madam President, I move that we deny the expulsion appeal as presented. A second. We have a motion and a second. Uh, all, all members in favor of the motion, um, please raise your hand. Okay, any opposed? Motion passes. The board vote was six to zero. This concludes the hearing. Ms. Mrs. Bush, you can now ask if there is a motion to adjourn this meeting. Can I make one comment real quick? Yes. Um, Ms. Worley, I do applaud your cooperation, and I truly believe that you are in the best program in the state and probably in the nation as far as 
our facility at JJAP is. It's absolutely phenomenal. I truly uh, believe that you regret your actions, and I do um, want you to make the most of your time there and do your absolute best so that you know Mr. Johnson can make whatever decision he feels is necessary for walking across the stage at graduation. Um, I really, really applaud you for using this as a learning opportunity and growing from this. So thank you for that. Good luck at your hearing tomorrow. Yes. Yep. Do I have a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. Second. <laughs> Eight. So adjourned. <laughs> <laughs>